Kia ora everyone, good afternoon. It is wonderful to be back. Uh, I do have rotten luck trying to get to Waipa, it seems. Every time there's a lockdown, it seems to coincide with a trip. Look, I do think just to start off with and, and sort of some covering remarks, we do still exist in a very uncertain time. And I say that because of how difficult it is to judge where the New Zealand economy, where Waipa's economy goes next. We've had a pretty good run so far in 2021. And up until uh, just a week or so back, we were feeling in a pretty confident position. In a sense, we're still relatively confident about the economic outlook, but what Lockdown 2.0 does highlight is that those disruptions and concerns, uncertainties around COVID-19 continue to exist. And until we not only have full vaccination coverage here in New Zealand, but also overseas, and with uh, variants of the virus continuing to evolve and spread throughout the world, this is going to be a, a very difficult uh expectation to try and manage how are we going to evolve going forward uh, because as good as the crystal ball normally is uh, it's pretty cloudy when COVID-19 descends. With that what I want to share with you today is a bit of an overview to start with of how we're seeing the national economy evolve uh, with lockdown. We've only had uh, two weeks or not even two weeks worth of data yet and we're only getting that at a national level but we'll then spin through what we're seeing uh, coming forward not only in Waipa at the moment but what momentum was building up like prior to lockdown 2.0 and look at some of those other key constraints and key concerns about where the economy is heading uh, into the future. Um, so we are back in lockdown again. That does cause a fairly uh, considerable restriction to economic activity. And I think we've just got to realise that we are putting the economy again uh, on ice. We're pressing pause on, on the TV for a bit uh, and it's going to be a little while until we can start to press play again. With that, we're seeing at the moment uh, quite a considerable drop, but an expected drop in spending activity. Uh, the day that the Prime Minister announced that there was a community case of COVID-19 uh, in New Zealand, we saw an immediate spike in spending activity. You can see there uh, spending activity on that day, that Tuesday, um, up nearly 40%. We saw that spending at supermarkets more than doubled. Um, the Great Toilet Paper Wars of uh, 2020 uh, coming back to haunt us, it seems. Although reports from supermarkets this time around uh, did show that shoppers were buying more uh, produce and, and fresh fruit and vegetables, uh, hopefully that's because they've already stocked up on all the toilet paper. Subsequent to that, the first 10 days of lockdown, we've seen a loss of over $500 million worth of spending. That's half a billion bucks worth of cash nationally that hasn't been spent across in shops, uh, with around about a, a, a 48 odd percent decline in spending. Now, that's considerable, but important to recognise that it's not as deep of a hit as we saw in lockdown one. Lockdown one, we saw a roughly 60 to 62% fall in spending. And so although this is considerable, what we're also um, growing to understand, uh, this lockdown 2.0 at least, is that businesses have found ways to operate at alert level four and also increasingly at alert level three with more contactless delivery uh, options and similar where businesses are able to operate and might be essential. You can see sort of just how big that spending drop is, though, uh, across uh, in 2021. Uh, you'll also note um, uh, that light, uh, that middle blue line there for 2020, a touch lower than 2019. August seems to be a rather bad month for COVID outbreaks. Of course, Auckland this time last year was an alert level three. Uh, New Zealand now finds itself at alert level four with the rest of the country outside of uh, Northland and Auckland, uh, of course, moving back to level three uh, at 11.59 tonight. So again, um, we are seeing quite a considerable hit to the economy. Now, both Infometrics and uh, various forecasters and government agencies have revised how bad of a hit uh, the economy is expected to take at each alert level. And I just wanted to profile that uh, here. This time uh, last year, when we first went into lockdown, Treasury estimated perhaps 40% of economic activity was unable to operate at alert level four. They've revised that now to around about 26%. That 26% is in line with our own expectations that around about 74% of economic activity can continue at alert level four. That's a quarter not able to operate, which is of course quite a considerable amount, but it also highlights that you've got around about three quarters that can still uh, operate in some way, shape or form, either because they're classified as a school or because they can work from home uh, and similar. So although we are certainly taking a, a 
fair chunk out of the economy, we do still see the activity uh, moving forward. Now, one of the things that gives me the confidence at the moment that we will bounce back strongly, and one of the reasons that we did see that strong bounce back in economic activity in 2020, is spending. Now, last year, New Zealand went into lockdown uh, in April, and uh, within three months of lockdown, our consumer spending activity was back above pre-pandemic levels. You can see that here. In China, of course, who locked down uh, at the start of the year, the, the first uh, uh, bastion of outbreak for COVID-19, took eight months for the consumer spending totals to get back to 2019 levels, even though they uh, were and, and still are seen as one of the strongest and fastest growing economies. Now, I say that because the resilience we saw last year in terms of spending highlights uh, what we are likely to see again, which is buying local uh, New Zealand consumers who are getting out there and, and putting the cash that they haven't uh, been able to spend throughout lockdown into operation, that is uh, likely to see better economic activity moving forward. We know that people save up a lot during lockdown uh, and they've got to put it somewhere and a lot of them want to put it somewhere. And so we are expecting a similar sort of resumption in spending activity. And you can see throughout the period, apart from uh, that dip in activity in August last year with the Auckland uh, lockdown, we've seen pretty comfortable levels of spending throughout uh, as well. These two slightly lower levels of New Zealand spending uh, highlighting Auckland at alert level three again in February uh, and March this year. On the whole, that tells us that New Zealanders are still more upbeat, they're still happy enough to spend, that confidence is coming forward. We are, that's not to say that uh, lockdown 2.0 will be completely without any changes. We still expect that the economy, uh, when you try to uh, shut down a quarter of it, does see some losses, it does see some concerns. We saw last week the first signs of that, a 2,000 plus increase in the number of people on job seeker support benefits uh, across the country, the first substantial increase uh, since earlier this year, right at the start of the year, in fact. Uh, and that, that look, what that tells us is that there's probably some businesses who are already still struggling from the continued effects of COVID-19 and lockdown too has probably been the straw that broke the camel's back. But again, we have seen fewer people on job job seeker support throughout the last uh, wee while and that again means that we're in a better starting position to weather the storm of lockdown 2.0. We're seeing uh, activity like I said um, is holding up better this time around. Uh, Google mobility data showing that we're uh, operating at almost as if it's Christmas in terms of how many people are going into workplaces. Um, what is interesting is that we are still moving around more this lockdown 2.0 than we were during lockdown one. Uh, on one hand, that says there's probably better uh, activity then for the economy, but slightly worrying if we do see too much uh, movement at level four, uh, highlighting we might see these higher alert levels for a while longer. And of course, that looks likely in Auckland given the current outbreak. Now, what does that all mean for the Waipa economy? Well, we're expecting that the Waipa economy continues to go in a pretty good uh, fashion. Our revised estimates of economic activity and uh, employment highlight that in Waipa, we're expecting nearly 63% of the local workforce is able to operate at alert level four, very much in line with the New Zealand average. Uh, and again, at alert level three, you can see the same proportion as the New Zealand average able to operate uh, and WIPA just over uh, 84%. Now, uh, the reason behind those averages and, and, and why you see WIPA almost smack bang uh, in the middle with the national average is a combination of sort of stronger retail uh, activity and similar and hospitality um, based around particularly in Cambridge and, and similar, uh, coupled with though that still strong primary sector uh, that, that WIPA um, is, it has, has as a key part of its economic profile. So balancing those together, you get a, a pretty uh, usual um, level of output in terms of what we're seeing across the rest of the country. That level of activity, again, highlights that although this is a hit, uh, there's still quite a few people that are going to be able to operate that provides confidence about uh, the local economy being able to go through this. We saw in the last lockdown and we've seen in recent times that traffic, heavy traffic activity, generally freight, uh, has been holding up better in Waipa than the rest of the country, even as uh, traffic activity across 
the rest of the country has still remained strong. And I highlight that just because, again, we expect a similar uh, pattern to emerge as we continue through lockdown. There still is quite a lot of activity happening in Waipa. And so although we're putting uh, the economy on ice, uh, the temperature for Waipa is, is, is slightly warmer, slightly more towards normal than the rest of the country. Again, building that picture of resilience that you see in the economy and hopefully that ability to bounce back strongly. Now, spending activity, uh, I mean, look, this is never going to be a pretty picture. Uh, when you tell people that the, really the only places you can go and purchase are from the supermarket uh, or from the petrol station, there's not a lot to be done. What you will notice, though, is that in the lead up to lockdown across uh, the 2021 year so far, you've seen considerably stronger spending activity growth in Waipa than comparator areas. Uh, the likes of Hamilton, if we compare to the likes of Hamilton, uh, the wider Waikato region or New Zealand on, on the whole, um, you can see Waipa there the first sort of few months of the year averaging around 5% above 2019 levels, uh, then shifting out up to over 10% hitting 15% before the lockdown. Uh, the other parts that we've been looking at, um, the likes of Waikato region doesn't only just manages to get to 10% uh, and Hamilton uh, slightly stop, softer still. Now again, that reiterates that there was already good spending momentum. Hopefully this lockdown being relatively short, sharp and sweet is, is, is the hope. Uh, certainly given the move to alert level three tonight, uh, that ability to hopefully regain that momentum and see those better spending results. Now it's important to highlight that that spending we saw in WIPA has been driven by locals uh, supporting their own. Uh, we saw quite a lot of that last year after lockdown by local campaigns and similar. Uh, we expect, and, and in effect, probably need to see a similar focus again this year. Uh, people who have got cash after lockdown, they haven't been able to spend, they're looking for an outlet. Hopefully they will want to see those local retailers continue and they'll put their money where their mouth is there to support uh, those local WIPA businesses. All of that better spending activity, all of that better economic momentum in general has continued to see more jobs uh, for those who reside in Waipa. You can see that looking at monthly filled job numbers continuing to track upwards. Uh, these short downshifts uh, are seasonal occurrence around the winter period, uh, around the summer periods rather. Uh, but you can see on the whole that strong trend now um, approaching 28,000 uh, in terms of the number of residential uh, people who are living in Waipa who are um, employed in a job. Now, that's important because, again, the more people that are employed who live locally, uh, of course, the more they're likely to spend uh, locally as well, particularly with that shift to working from home. So, again, those numbers for Waipa building into that strength uh, of the local economy coming into this. We do expect a setback in job hiring. That's to be expected given lockdown. Uh, but, again, we're hoping that as we saw during this uh, period here when you did see the effects of COVID-19 start to affect jobs. It's likely just a plateauing in economic activity and job hiring for a touch before uh, we continue and resume that growth uh, track. Looking across the sectors in terms of who's growing and who's not, we can see funnily enough that construction uh, a strong grower as we've been moving forward uh, over or nearly 180 additional jobs over the last year. Also strength in retail trade. Now, remembering that was an industry we thought would be hard hit by COVID-19 at a national level, but uh, with that strength of local activity, with the strong basis around the primary sector, high levels of construction, uh, and also visitors coming in from our other parts of the country, uh, we've seen retail activity remain strong. Strength in the likes of wholesale trade also reflects a similar sort of trend. If you've got a lot uh, of businesses who are still needing to buy uh, stock, that's going to support wholesale trade activity. And the increase in professional scientific and technical services uh, probably reinforces that trend around working from home more people being employed in that sector too. The other end of the spectrum, uh, that slight dip in manufacturing and agri, uh, ag forestry and fishing, part of that certainly at a national level that we're seeing, and, and I've got no reason to believe it's different in Waipa, um, is the difficulty around finding some of those workers during the seasonal periods. Um, that's certainly something that we've been uh, seeing across the country and we expect is coming through here uh, as well. Moving forward, um, we again, we've seen a, a better uh, 
trend and activity for job seekers. Uh, it's the one indicator in many regards uh, that you want to see going down rather than going up. And we have seen that. Uh, 2021, we've continued a decline in job seeker support levels. Uh, current levels as of July, uh, still sitting nearly 350 more than 2019 levels, uh, but on the right track. Again, we do expect a slight setback uh, with lockdown 2.0, but given that, that there was a strong downwards uh, trend, we're still likely to see that resume uh, once we get towards the end of 2021. Important to note that there's still around 900 to 1,000 people, even in normal times, who are on job seeker support. And because we know we've got skill shortages and challenges around the labour market, it highlights that work that uh, needs to continue happening to support more people into employment and make sure they have the right skills and tools uh, to do that. Because it's not that we don't have enough people to work, it's again that we can't match up who wants to work and, and what uh, people uh, want work to be done. I do want to profile uh, the changes that we're continuing to see around travel, remembering uh, that it would have been this, uh, this time last year, everyone was telling me that the Trans-Tasman bubble was days away from opening. Uh, and that in, in October, it was days away from opening. In November, it was days away from opening. Uh, and it took until April 2021, an entire year after the pandemic started, to get open with our nearest and dearest Australia. Uh, and we've subsequently closed that again. That suggests to me that we are not seeing international travel come back anything like uh, what it was pre-pandemic. In fact, we heard this week that Air New Zealand made it, uh, made it very clear that they've actually decommissioned some of their old planes that used to fly longer routes. They will never fly again uh, with the company just uh, making it clear that that sort of travel is not going to resume to the same levels. Our expectations around travel haven't changed much, and so I won't dwell too much on this picture, which is a relatively um, still shallow, uh, well, fast resumption with Australia when we can eventually get things going, um, but again, still not returning to anywhere nor near normal levels of travel. In a sense, we're going to have to start pushing this out a bit more. Uh, the thinking was we might get a bit more travel at the start of 2022, Given that we can't even travel to Australia at the moment, uh, I think we've got to be realistic with our uh, expectations of travel. It's not going to happen again uh, very quickly. We're also seeing that although New Zealanders are still travelling around, they are, aren't flying as much as they used to. Uh, this chart here showing uh, the number of pa uh, monthly Air New Zealand domestic passengers uh, across the domestic network, still in a strong position, but not quite as high as it was uh, pre-pandemic. Instead, we are seeing more people driving across the country. It's a, a fact that uh, I've shared with, with uh, councillors and, and others in YPAR before, um, but it is worth reiterating, I think, again, towards the bottom of my screen for the um, top and bottom uh, areas, we can see the likes of most of our usual uh, areas in terms of um, uh, the tourism-focused hotspots, Fiordland, Mackenzie, Queenstown, Rotorua, West Coast, uh, all in decline over the six months to June. The other end of the spectrum, uh, we've got the likes of Tide Arthur Gisborne in a stronger position. Not a lot of tourism to start with, so the boost that has been seen in recent times has provided more support. Uh, and other areas close by to our uh, major urban centres doing well, uh, everyone from Wellington having wine over in the Wairarapa, uh, Christchurch uh, folk heading up to Hamna Springs and Huranui, uh, everyone uh, from the Manawatu going across to Whanganui for a weekend uh, and, and uh, so, so on and so forth. All of that, again, just highlighting that there is still a fair bit of tourism activity, but it's not moving around the same as it used to. Now, if we look at monthly levels of activity for the Hamilton and Waikato uh, tourism RTO, just because these are the uh, what we're seeing in, in the local uh, regard, you can see that those numbers um, coming through are, are still holding up in a pretty strong regard and that there's more domestic uh, tourism as well. We are continuing to see people uh, having a look around the wider Waikato region coming through to Waipa and similar. As we continue, though, I do want to reinforce the view that at the start of 2021, a lot of tourism operators were hoping and holding out hope that 2022 would bring the resumption in travel. It now seems very hard to see that coming through. And we're worried that some businesses might have been hanging out for international tourism to resume and therefore hoping that the domestic boost was just a blip before internationals uh, started to revive. 
We think that's the wrong plan. We think that instead businesses do need to be quite uh, finely attuned to the fact that domestic tourism and the, and the focus on domestic travel will need to be a core element of domestic uh, of tourism activity generally in New Zealand. Uh, so uh, we are going to need to see product offering offerings emerge uh, and change for that domestic sector. Um, when we focus on a new way of working as well, I think um, uh, again it's it's a it's a trend we've continued to profile, but we are uh, it, it remains a key focus for a number of areas, and why Par of course stands uh, quite well uh, to benefit from these changes, and that is that working from home trend um, and seeing where people are spending their money. Uh, you can see here the great toilet paper wars of 2020 and and the latest emergence in that battle uh, in recent times. What you will see, absent the obvious lockdown hit recently, is again that stronger profile of spending still on groceries and on home and recreation, to a degree offsetting the uh, slightly softer levels of spending on the likes of hospitality uh, and what have you. And again, just reiterates that people are spending more time at home. And again, if we profile the the uh, the urbans versus the the nearbys, um, again you, you see a very similar profile uh, again. And I, I won't dwell on this because I've I've shown it a few times, but the trend is holding, uh, and it is quite sustained. And that means as well, again, that momentum to get going post lockdown for these areas and for Waipar as well. We saw that on earlier slides, remains quite strong. Uh, the you know the drop already um, in spending for the likes of Wellington, Auckland, Christchurch. That's going to be a much tougher uh, start to go from much a much colder engine. Uh, other regional economies able to pick up pace a lot faster, and then again just those changes that we've seen across uh, in terms of uh, net migration or uh, net internal migration as well. Now, one of the difficulties we're starting to see, one of the changes that's emerging uh, as COVID-19 ha has, has moved through is that the change in our border uh, restrictions has really quite fundamentally altered our labour market. We've had a lot of spending activity uh, over the last 18 months since we got out of uh, lockdown one, and that has meant that there's been a lot of demand for additional working across the economy, both in Waipa and uh, as you saw with those earlier job numbers, but across the entire economy as well. Those tighter labour market settings mean that we, we do have to sort of bear them in mind as we think about uh, moving into the future. We've seen the unemployment rate uh, continue to drop a lot uh, faster than we had previously expected. Um, you'll see even in July this year, we expected the unemployment rate uh, about two months out was likely to hold uh, relatively steady um, as we move forward. Um, again, that expectation that there was still some weakness in the labour market, there was still some disruption from COVID-19. Uh, the official numbers uh, said, actually, no, that's not right. Uh, unemployment plunging from 4.6% to 4% on a seasonally adjusted basis um, across the country. And we're expecting it could well go lower still. Uh, what, what I get, guess is important to note is you'll note that we made it to this 4% level uh, in prior times ahead of COVID-19, um, but we didn't go too far below it. We went a touch below it before the GFC, uh, but not too much further. What we are worried about this time, though, is that given we're already in this position uh, and there's still a fair amount of economic activity to try and get through, you know, there's still high levels of spending, there's still high levels of construction, similar, uh, that does mean the difficulty in finding labour is likely to continue uh, to persist. We've seen that all measures of the labour market are showing tightness. Not only is the number of people uh, unemployed falling, but we're also seeing the number of people who are working but want to work more also falling as they get uh, more hours as they want. Uh, a survey of businesses carried out by NZIR uh, highlights that it's now the most difficult period on record to find both skilled and unskilled workers, uh, that survey stretching back to the 70s. So businesses now reporting that they are finding it incredibly difficult to find the workers that they want to do that work. Um, and again, that struggle between having people available but not possibly uh, able to fill the roles uh, required is still quite a key concern. And we see that in Waipa, given those higher numbers of uh, uh, monthly filled jobs that I showed you at the start, that continuing upward shift uh, reiterating uh, these figures. We're also seeing that the number of job ads across the economy is incredibly high. Now, I've extended the MB job ad series back to the 1990s, uh, and you'll see just how quite incredible the current level of job advertising is. 
Now, what we see and hear across the economy, we've heard this uh, directly from the Waikato as well, um, and we see in some of the SEEK numbers, is that although job ad numbers are high, the number of people applying for each job ad have declined quite considerably. So there's a lot of uh, places uh, and, and jobs on offer but not as many people applying for those same jobs. Again, reiterating that difficulty of matching up the demand for labour and the actual supply uh, of people. And we've got to be realistic that the settings have fundamentally changed for New Zealand. Prior to COVID-19, we had over 5,000 net migrants a month coming into the country. There's now only 370. And in fact, we're expecting that to drop a, a touch lower given that we've seen uh, MIQ spaces limited because of the Delta variant and because of lockdown too. All of that again, suggesting that we've got some big changes coming to the economy. When we look at annual net migration, uh, I mean, the, the graph is relatively self-explanatory. You, you're seeing a much, much lower number of people coming into the country each year uh, relative to what we had prior. That means that for businesses, the way that they used to find their talent uh, and, and the number of people they were able to source as skilled migrants is going to be greatly diminished. The government has recently announced in, in, uh, in response to a question from the opposition that it does uh, expect to have a considerably lower level of net migration coming into the country. Now, if that comes true, and it certainly is, is hard to see it doing anything but that, the government's been quite clear on its ex expectations, we're going to have to fundamentally uh, reconsider how we resource our labour market because at the moment um, we're stressed to the edge you know um, there's there's considerable pressure building in the labour market and in our mind there's no real way to release that pressure we don't have net migration to be able to bring in those skilled workers and so the difficulties of matching supply and demand for workers will likely persist for a number of years. And that's meaning that we are seeing higher uh, pressures placed on inflation, but also on wages as we move forward. Um, you'll see those early signs moving there uh, in terms of uh, wage inflation starting to push higher. Now, things aren't at uh, incredibly high levels yet. Uh, wages are always a bit of a lagging indicator, but those changes in, in direction uh, do start to highlight that there is more pressure and that with uh, still a lot of work to be done, still a lot of jobs to be filled, but not as many people perhaps available to fill them as previous times, we are going to see more uh, of those labour market pressures. We've started to hear quite a considerable amount about job poaching and similar, um, trying to find a, a guy from another firm to bring into your operation uh, and firms needing to pay more, not only to keep their current workers, but also to attract new workers in. Those older issues continue to re-emerge. Uh, we're seeing housing uh, uh, pressures across the economy remain strong. Um, our latest forecast from July, and in fact the government's budget uh, forecast for house price growth shown here in the dashed lines, uh, you will see that recent growth has uh, completely grow, uh, blown those expectations out of the water. House price growth now uh, running in Waipa and the wider Waikato region and New Zealand as a whole, above 25% per annum. That is a considerably steep uh, level of price growth. Now, I want to give you five quick reasons, again, why we're expecting uh, uh, house price growth to need to slow back. And then I'll show you my next slide, which is the one reason that it won't emerge quite as quickly. Those five reasons are we have seen uh, the government try to limit back demand uh, with um, uh, the removal of interest deductibility uh, for investors. And the Reserve Bank has made considerable moves to limit back on risky lending. Uh, of course, LVRs have been reintroduced they've been clamped down on or they're being consulted to be clamped down on further and the Gov, uh, Reserve Bank is looking at implementing debt to income uh, limits next year. If debt to income limits were introduced at one, depending on what level you set them at, they could cut out anywhere from 50% uh, to 25% of first home buyer lending if they're set at the usual five to six DTI level. Now the Reserve Bank's not going to do that, that would absolutely cut the legs out from first home buyers but it does underscore that we've got a lot of people who are borrowing at very high levels relative to their income, and that does cause you some concerns around financial stability. 
So those are, th th those are two of our issues. We're seeing high levels of uh, building activity at the moment as well, which is helping to address the undersupply across the country. Uh, we see still strong levels of building in Waipa, and I'll get to those in a moment. We've also got uh, less people coming in, as I showed you just before, and that means lower population growth. And then we're also seeing very, very clear signs that interest rates are about to head higher. Uh, the Reserve Bank only holding back uh, in their August monetary policy statement because uh, the proximity of alert level changes less than 24 hours before the statement was delivered, New Zealand was plunged back to alert level four. Um, the thinking was, look, given the uncertainty around the change in alert levels, let's tie ho for a minute. Uh, but the bank making it very clear that if these current pressures continue to persist and there's no reason to expect they won't, interest rates will start to rise and we've already seen one year rates pushing higher still. Those are the five reasons all combined that we should see lower demand for housing and also higher supply. But at the moment, we've got quite reduced supply of existing homes on the market. If we look at the number of properties available for sale uh, across the Waikato region, and, and look, this graph mirrors the national average, um, we can see that the number available for sale is considerably lower than usual, uh, sitting at roughly 41% of usual levels uh, of property available for sale. And so again, reiterating what we've said a number of times before, that if the plan is to play musical chairs with the existing uh, stock of housing, we will lose this game, uh, which again profiles that focus on building more. Without more properties on the market, you've still got a lot of people who want to buy, not as many people available uh, to sell. And that means that we are likely to see prices continuing to be bid up. All of that reinforcing that although we're expecting house price growth to soften and to flatten away, we're not expecting any particular house price falls. And we're expecting it could take longer than first expected for that flattening in house price growth to occur. Now, all of that has combined in my part to see uh, unaffordability continuing to edge higher. We're seeing that again, though, across the country. For WIPA uh, on our March data, uh, the uh, average house price to average household income ratio rising to six. Uh, for New Zealand, it's headed above seven. And for the wider Waikato region, we've seen it head to about six and a half. Uh, all of those numbers continuing to show that across the country, we're seeing difficulties uh, around affordability. Of course, WIPA sitting below the national average and below the Waikato region average also um, providing though some support for activity locally uh, because people who might have been in the Auckland market or some more expensive parts of the Waikato market uh, off, often might be starting to look for those other options and Waipa still provides um, some, some key elements there. We're not expecting as much activity to come forward in the infrastructure space. The government talk, has talked a big talk on that front, and you'll, uh, you can see there we're not expecting too many uh, big shifts uh, in infrastructure. Part of that being um, that we are still worried about the government strategy, particularly around transport funding. Uh, we, of course, had the, the big bridge that won't uh, and, and from coming through from Auckland being announced and then sort of not really announced and being pulled back. At the same time, of course, as councils around the country were given a letter saying, hey, you know how you thought you'd get a whole bunch of CapEx? Well, maybe not quite as much uh, as you thought. Um, that has caused some quite considerable concerns around the country over levels of investment and similar. So on that basis, we're not confident that there's a huge amount more that can be done in the infrastructure space, just given the capacity constraints and sometimes the lack of strategy and, and, and ability from government to roll uh, some of that activity out. Now, why does all this matter? Well, it's because we see that at the moment there's still a considerable uh, level of need in the housing space. The state housing waitlist nationally rising to above 24,000 uh, after a pretty, I mean, this goes back to, to 2001, and you can see a, a real rapid increase in recent years. In Waipa, we've seen a similar shift, although not nearly as pronounced growth, uh, averaging below 20 uh, households uh, all the way up until around about 2017, uh, now sitting uh, just a touch above 100 uh, at present. Now, again, that's not uh, uh, as big of a number as, uh, as we've seen in the national figures, but important to reiterate that is still 100 households in the local area that are needing more support uh, and are still really struggling uh, to make their way to and to stay in a house. 
There is still more activity coming forward. Uh, and I just want to profile that Waipa has been seeing a sustained level of high building activity uh, since particularly 2018 moving forward after, a, a, of course, a dip away um, through the through the sort of mid part of the, or the early part of the 2010s rather um, before the entire construction sector got going. So the levels of activity now are, are, are certainly high and sustained and that provides again that confidence over providing more, uh, more housing into the market and also meeting those demands of WIPAR's uh, strong growth. Just looking at what that looks like across a few other areas. Now, I've indexed this data, uh, so don't worry too much about the level. Just if you will look at the difference in the lines, and you'll see there that WIPA uh, is trending in a higher position than what we've seen in the likes of Hamilton, Waikato region, or New Zealand. And that reiterates, again, that high level of building uh, you can see in WIPA. It is worth profiling, though, just again, that you have seen that plateauing in activity in recent years. Uh, and really, that just reiterates that there's a lot of work going on and there's only so much uh, that you can do at any one time. Looking at non-residential, a similar sort of story emerges. Uh, looking from 2016 onwards, you can see that that push higher and uh, in, in activity and a higher base load, if you will. Um, you look over this period, 2016 to, to sort of 2018 or so, you're averaging uh, probably around about $40 million uh, per annum. Uh, you're now at, at, at around about a, a hundred, if not more. Um, so again, just much higher levels of building uh, happening locally. And the trend as well, uh, looking from 1992 going forward, that, that level in recent times is quite impressive relative to what we're seeing in other parts. Again, reiterates some of the strategy that Council's taken around uh, providing for industrial and commercial uh, development land and similar. So that is, again, supporting economic activity, both directly and indirectly. Now, the very last part before I uh, move over to some questions, and again, I guess just the, the forewarning here is that I, I, there are some challenges we're seeing in the economy, but they are better challenges uh, that we're starting to have to face than the risk that we had last year, which was doom and gloom and an economy in disarray with hundreds of thousands of jobs, lost businesses uh, uh, keeling over and spending activity considerably uh, down. But nonetheless, they are issues that I think we have to have to face and be serious about because they do uh, raise concerns. And that is over some of those supply chain issues as well. Now, we know uh, that the sector is, is doing particularly well. You can see commodity prices, uh, the ANZ uh, Commodity Price Index holding up in a stronger regard in recent times. Uh, we are seeing a little bit of evidence of commodity prices just pulling back a touch. Um, for example, in the dairy sector, we've got quite high milk volumes and similar, and that's just um, putting a bit more supply than the market was originally expecting. But on the whole, we are seeing um, those commodity prices holding up stronger. Now, given the importance of dairy to the WIPA economy, these commodity prices are going to be a, a real uh, source of strength. Um, again, it's providing more money coming in locally, and that's uh, supporting that wider spend out in terms of um, the, the primary sector being able to spend on their uh, needs and those businesses supported by the primary sector, therefore having more that they can themselves contribute out. All of that remaining uh, quite important. But it's really expensive to send stuff overseas at the moment. Oh. Uh, we're continuing to see those freight costs at just incredible levels. Um, you know, pre-pandemic, uh, the freight, this freight index that we were looking at, sitting at around about, uh, I think, one, one to one and a half thousand uh, in terms of value. We're now talking over 10,000. I mean, the numbers are incredible here. Um, a business I talked to again uh, in Auckland about four weeks ago saying that their uh, freight costs shipping uh, anytime, uh, anywhere between uh, four and six times uh, above usual levels. That's a lot of additional money that you're having to somehow find to uh, cope with these increases. Now, what I want to profile there is, is probably the most important thing that this isn't done yet. Um, we're hoping this bit here is a bit of a plateau an uh, activity like we saw at the start of 2021. Uh, but let's be clear, we've seen an increase over 2020, a bit of a plateauing and then a pretty sharp increase again since then. In our minds, it's another 18 to 24 months before freight activity starts to get back towards normal. And for a period, that's going to mean, again, higher freight shipping costs and similar. And we do signal that as a key concern, that the difficulty of being able to have resources, get them into the country and get your exports out of the country, it, it is going to be a, a key consideration. 
and we're seeing that as well in terms of export volumes. Uh, if we look at the amount of exports going out by sea and coming in by sea, you'll see that uh, drop away in imports starting to come back, but a pretty massive hole we've left uh, in here so far. Just as importantly, sea exports taking a, a bit of a softer period in recent uh, months, showing better promise in, in the last few. Uh, but again, just really reiterating that there are concerns there over being able to get our exports out. What does that mean from a council perspective particularly? We do uh, wonder about procurement and similar in terms of being able to get imports in from overseas, um, needing to be quite careful around timeframes, being able to, to respond to those wider timeframes. Uh, but also thinking about alternatives in terms of where else production might be able to occur and similar, um, all options I think that we're starting to see people consider to be on the table. With that, I, I guess the, the too long don't read because there was an enormous amount of, of information in there, but I did want to try and be as comprehensive as possible, is that the Waipa economy will take a, a step back because of lockdown 2.0, as will all parts of the New Zealand economy. But we're also expecting, because of that stronger momentum and the lead up to lockdown 2.0 and the fundamentals of that Waipara economy already uh, with that strong primary sector, with strong construction activity, with strong retail activity uh, and visitor tourism, all of that positions Waipa well uh, to weather the storm and to come out strongly the other side. We do expect that those same concerns and pressures that were existing in the Waipa economy pre-lockdown two will exist post-lockdown two as well around supply chain issues, uh, around the likes of, uh, of labour markets and similar. And we're also expecting that those higher interest rates do start to limit back just how much uh, that those high levels of spending continue. Uh, tempering back activity a touch uh, is expected, but Waipa in a strong position to weather the storm uh, and expected to come out the other side.